will call the um, meeting of the Board of Directors of the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools to order at 6.33 on Wednesday, August 3rd. I don't see any members of the public, so that takes care of public comment, I guess. Is there a motion? Nick, Nick Connor is a staff person, yeah. so. But there are five participants, so, well, okay, no, I'm seeing now who the five are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we can move on to the Oh, and somebody just popped oh. up. Oh, great. Is that Amanda? I think it's Amanda. Oh. <laughs> She's under an alias, though. <laughs> Diana. <laughs> and wearing an amazing chapeau. <laughs> Amanda, welcome. We're just getting started. Okay. Consent agenda? I'd like to make a motion we approve the consent agenda with the addition of the co-curricular um, salary payments. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, wow. Kicking it over to you, Mike and Libby. And I might note, 26 minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> We like, we like that quite a bit. <laughs> that would be an agenda mistake <laughs> right there. No, it was just a lot of time allotted for public comment and the consent agenda. <laughs> there you go. It's a cut and paste error right there. Um, so I have I have uh, pulled in Mike and Nick Connor. Nick is our community liaison who has never made an appearance at a board meeting. Um, so I'd like you get to meet the fabulous Nick Connor. Um, and Nick's here basically to give some background to one of our goals that we're about to present to you um, because he's the expert in that field. Um, so uh, Mike's here to present our continuous improvement plan as required by the Agency of Education. It is a requirement to get board approval for this plan um, and it also is due in a couple weeks. Um, so we wanted to get that in front of you. It's just some background around this process has changed over um, several years, certainly since I've been a curriculum director, um, but now it's it's directly tied to the recovery plan from COVID, the statewide recovery plan from COVID. So there are some controls around us uh, as to some of the categories and things we need to choose and, and that kind of thing. So I will hand this over to Mike with Nick to add in any, any comments he feels necessary. So I'll just talk a little bit about the structure of the plan. Uh, one of the big changes is that the AOE used to have each individual school do a CIP plan annually connected to the comprehensive needs assessment and the district do um, a CIP plan as well. They've changed that. Now it's one per district um, and it needs to be addressing two different categories, um, safe and healthy schools and academic achievement. The other change is that rather than doing this annually, they've changed the timeline now so it's a two-year plan. Um, and I think they base this on a lot of feedback from the, the, the stakeholders and the groups in, in the schools in that it was hard to submit plans and goals in March and then start the following year and the timeline never really worked. So a two-year plan is going to work really great for schools and districts to be able to really push into these plans. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Nick to introduce the first goal that we have on here around chronic absentee. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so the first goal um, is really about reducing uh, the amount of young people in our district who are, are missing too much school. And so the, the specific uh, language there is uh, really moving um, the number of young people who are chronically absent from 32.3%, which is where we were at last year, uh, down to 20% by 2024. Um, so to define chronic absenteeism, I think that's a really important place to start. Um, chronic absenteeism is when you, uh, a student misses 10% or more days in a school year. Uh, what that means is that includes both excused and unexcused absences. Um, it also includes suspensions. So really what chronic absenteeism is, is doing is looking at the amount of time young people are out of school losing instructional time. The shift here is really going from a place of what has historically been a focus on unexcused absences 
uh, really driving home, this is truancy, this is the law, we have to talk about court, and then shift that uh, really to talking about uh, every absence is adding up and we care about that. So we're, we're taking it to a more restorative place where we're not just coming at it with blame and coming at it from a threat of court, but going at it more from a place of uh, how can we as a district be supporting you as a family, you as a student. Uh, so again, last year we had 32% of our students that were chronically absent. So they missed 10% or more school. Um, I think some folks might be quick to say, well, that is just because of COVID. Uh, and while that is a piece of it, uh, there's a whole lot more behind it. We're not talking about five missed days or 10 missed days or 15 missed days. To be chronically absent, you need to miss 18 days of school in our district. Uh, and 18 days of school is the amount of student days that we have in the month of October. So essentially it's like missing October uh, is really what we're looking at. Um, so this goal is gonna be really critical as far as uh, you know, our students being able to be successful in our district. You gotta be there to learn. And so that's essentially what this goal is driving home at. Um, the ways to get at this kind of the strategies as Mike has outlined in the improvement plan um, is really the community liaison role, which I'm in, uh, and really kind of utilizing that role to respond to students and families that are missing school uh, and using some systems that we've built, which I'll speak to in a second. Um, this will also be supplemented with um, Jess, our new director of social emotional learning and wellness, who's going to be helping kind of bring some of those components to some of the outreach I'm doing outside of school and also tie in those things that are happening outside of school into the classroom. Uh, we're also going to be adding in some new mental health supports, uh, trying to really respond to young people who have named pretty directly that, you know, these last two years are hard and we need more support. And we have so many young people on waiting lists just to see a therapist. Um, you know, that's impacting their ability to come to school and be successful in school. So really looking to boost that as well. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're really looking at how can we link what's happening outside of the classroom to inside the classroom. So working with instructional leaders across the district, when a student is disengaged or a student is uh, out of school for quite a bit of time, while they may work with me and get to a place where they wanna come back, it's not that helpful if the teacher's not on the same page as what's been happening and they don't have the context of what's going on at home. They don't have the context of what supports are in place that have been helpful. So we really need to tie those together because sometimes what can happen is they may re-engage in school, the teacher doesn't have all the context, that student feels like they don't have that sense of belonging that we all know is really important, and then they're back out of school again. So really tying those together is an important strategy to work toward this goal. Um, the other thing that we're doing is uh, introducing a new data system that we're going to be using, which is going to be kind of a early warning uh, system, but it's really going to be able to identify young people uh, early on in the process. So, uh, you know, next week is a week of home visits for me, for example, because we know who these young people are just looking at our data from last year. How can we offer support before they get to this point of being chronically absent? Um, so using this new data system will bring this to all the school teams as well so that we all know the young people that are at risk of really becoming chronically absent, missing out on that education. Um, restorative practices is the other layer that I would put in there as well. So this really does change how we respond to attendance from a, a strictly compliance and unexcused absence perspective to a restorative uh, perspective. What I mean by that is that we are really trying to take a holistic response to young people missing school. Uh, there are a lot of reasons and a lot of valid reasons why students are out of school. Uh, and we need to start with, tell me about how we can help. Tell me about what happened. Not start with blame or this is what's wrong or here's a letter that's going to talk about language of state's attorney and court. Um, that's not a good place to start. So it's really bringing in some of those restorative principles that we as a district have been moving towards over the past couple of years. Um, to really tie that into our systemic response to students missing school. Uh, the measures, uh, I kind of mentioned that already. So that is uh, kind of our database and our, our uh, chronic absenteeism dashboard is what we call it. Um, and that's gonna really tell us, you know, are we hitting this mark or not? That's what's telling us 32% of our students or about 362 students to be specific were chronically absent last year. Um, that's what's telling us how many days students are missing. So that data is gonna be really important as we look at how we're measuring this. We're also gonna be looking at feedback from our stakeholders, from our families, from our students, from teachers. So 
really making sure that are we hitting this target that we're aiming toward. Um, and then the last column there, as Mike has outlined, is what are the resources that are going to go to this. So again, the community liaison position is really going to be focused on this quite a bit. Um, our director of SEL and wellness, Jess, who uh, I'm super excited, will be joining some of these efforts and bringing some of her expertise uh, to, to our students and families, both inside and outside of school, the data systems we're using, um, the guiding coalitions, uh, the therapeutic supports that I mentioned before, all of these, these pieces are gonna be really important components to be able to meet this goal. Um, so I think that hits it, Mike. I don't know if there are other things that uh, are on there for this goal. The bingo there, Nick, thanks. Um, so are there any questions about the first goal? I guess we could start there if that's okay. I have a question, not so much about the goal, but just about the, the problem. 30% um, seems kind of high. Is that about average for, you know, across the country or is that, you know? Yeah, that so uh, thinking that's high is the good response. It is high. Um, and so really what we've seen across the country over the past couple of years from the pandemic is the national numbers are, um, you know, it's like 8 million students are chronically absent back in 2019. That number is up to 16. Uh, and so it's double. Uh, so there are 16 million students across the country that are now chronically absent. So we've seen the number double uh, throughout the pandemic across the country. Speaking to our district, I don't have as quality of data as I think I would like from maybe three years ago to really be able to dial in on our chronic absenteeism rates. Uh, I would expect that we have followed that same trend of seeing, you know, we probably had a, a chronic absenteeism rate closer to 15 to 20% prior to the pandemic. Um, and now we've just seen that, you know, really hit hard over the last couple of years. I have a question too that relates to that is, um, so have you dug into the, when you dig into individual students um, that represent that 30%, do you have any trends that you're seeing? Is it, you know, can you, can you share with us enough information to give us a snapshot without, you know, um, violating privacy stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, the reason young people are, are missing school is just across the board. Um, mental health is certainly a trend, um, something that's been identified time and again with being out of school, it's hard to go back in. We are relearning the habits of what it means to be in school consistently to keep those relationships. So that's been one thing that's definitely risen to the top. Ultimately, the pandemic has exacerbated, you know, all of the things that we already knew and made them worse, right? So if you're a young person and you are on the fence with feeling good about being in school or feeling like you have a sense of belonging with your peers, having positive relationships with your teacher, and you're maybe on the fence before the pandemic, you're off that fence after being out of school for that long and having disrupted learning. So we've seen that also dramatically increase just because students are not feeling as connected to their peers. They're not feeling as connected to their teachers. Like we as a district and across the country, rightfully so, put up quite literal barriers <laughs> to people being in our schools. And we're now in a place where we need to shift that trend. We wanna make sure that students and families know that they are welcome. Yes, we are still responding to a health crisis and the mentality around, is it important to be in school needs to shift across the country and here in our district. Um, so I think that there are a lot of reasons. We have young people experiencing homelessness. We have young people having panic attacks at the thought of wanting to go to school. Um, we have young people that just feel like you know, it's not that important. You know, I'm, I'd rather just do something online and from home when we see those students fade away or disengage. So it really is across the board. It's just that the pandemic has pushed all of those things we already knew to another level. Is there, is there a sort of consistent number of kids who, um, I know several years ago when my kids were attending a program called Earthwalk, they were counted as being chronically absent because they were doing one day a week outside of the school, but it was sort of a planned absence. Is there sort of a, a sort of a general static number of kids who do things like that on a regular basis outside of school and then are counted in these numbers? Yes, and those numbers are pretty low. So we do have students that attend like the farm program, for example, 
and may miss a day, uh, a week, or every other day. Uh, those families all know me because I've called and talked to them and make sure that they're good and that they need anything. And that number is really small compared to the number that we're seeing. Um, it's really not a significant number of students that are maybe taking advantage of some other program that isn't quite school sanctioned. Amanda? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you, Nick. I, I have a question in relationship to the demographics. Um, and like, are we looking at kids in special education that are also in this in this um, pocket of our youth, uh, biracial, BIPOC children? I know you can't tell us those numbers, but um, just like we mix all of those populations. Yeah, uh, I, I, what do I we can see? say that, yes, we, we are very much looking at that. That is built into that uh, chronic absenteeism dashboard. There's drop downs where you can select certain demographics, be that IEP status, whatever it may be, and we're able to slice it any which way that we have as far as demographics go to really be able to take a look at our systems as well to ensure that we don't have those you know, systemic barriers uh, and, and how are we responding to that if we do. Thank you. Can I ask, do, well, do we Kristen, have a, Kristen, oh, sorry. Um, Nick, I just want to really appreciate one, just like this very intentional shift away from like shame and blame to this like partnering with, with youth and families. It just feels really spot on and really supportive. Um, and I'm curious, like what it looks like in terms of like, yes, we know that like building strong relationships with staff and between peers is really important. And what does that look like when it's gonna like hit the ground, right? Like there's a lot of academic recovery. We know there's a lot of need, like that's the second goal. Do we have any like concrete ideas around what that's gonna look like in classrooms? Yeah, um, Kristen, specifically, are you referring to like recovery after being out or just what that whole integration? Well, yeah, it just sounds like a, a primary strategy or something that we need, we know that needs to take place, like when students feel like they really belong and that they're really connected both to teachers and to their peers, that they're more likely to come to school. So I'm curious, like what space is being made like in the school day or via what programs or initiatives or like fall kickoff events or school kickoff events that we know that are going to like get kids going, you know, feeling really positive about being back at school. If we know any of that, the teachers are still like, they're not back in the buildings yet. It's still unfolding, but I'm just curious if any yeah. of that's. Yeah, there's a couple of things that I would speak to on that. One is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of home visits happening in the summer. So again, uh, we have a lot of data in front of us that indicate, you know, we, we know these families, we know these students that may benefit from that extra early outreach. So that's happening, home visits. I'll be working with some of our administrators and, and folks in the district to be doing those home visits from a place of, we're excited to have you and not from a place of, why are you not here? Which is typically when the first home visit happens. So that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing is I'm at uh, every school's um, uh, team meetings for student support. And I'm reviewing the students that I'm working with and really developing a plan with our counselors, our social workers, uh, the folks in our school that are going to be kind of that first welcome, right? Like I'll be outside of school working with them, but when they walk in that door, there needs to be a good handoff and there needs to be a welcoming environment for that student, somebody who has context and um, it really knows kind of some of the facts and, and some of the support that's been really helpful to that student. So that bridge is also happening quite a bit because I'm in those student support meetings every single week with all of our schools to discuss these students. Beyond that, our students that have maybe missed an extended time, um, we're bringing in all of their teachers as best we're able as well to really talk about, hey, the student will be back tomorrow. We're really excited about this. It's also going to be really hard. And here are some strategies. How can I be helpful to you in this classroom environment? How can other administrators in the building be helpful to this class to you in this classroom environment? Again, because once that student is able to get to that point where they're able to stick back into school, it's not that helpful if that teacher is somewhat blindsided by this is a student I haven't seen in a month. I don't know how or what to even say to them or where they're at academically. So we're really trying to front load all of those things. And I think there's several tiers uh, that we're trying to hit prior to that student even stepping back into the classroom. Great, thanks Nick. Yeah. Emma, and then I have a question. 
Um, I was just wondering if there was a presentation that we could use to follow along with this. I didn't see it in the board packet. Well, Libby has emailed it separately, but do you have it, Libby? Could you get it up on Zoom? Are you able to present? You mean the CIP plan that I Yeah, and, and the CNP or CNA. I can't remember. There, there were two. Emma, did you not get that? Um, I was just looking in the initial email, and then I was also looking online at board materials. So it's not in either of those. So right. I'm sure I did get it. I just didn't have time to read other emails tonight. But it should probably be posted online with board materials. Yeah, it will be. Yeah. I believe I sent it to the board yesterday morning. OK. So. so while Libby's pulling that up, Nick, I'll ask my question. I remember when we hired you, the district hired you, one of the things I remember Libby saying was that your sort of caseload was going to be a very small number of students and you could um, go very deep and build and do the great work you do to build relationships. You, clearly, the circumstances have changed. Do we have enough support for you to be able to handle this expanded caseload? Yeah, I, I think we do. Uh, I think the caseload essentially is still a smaller caseload. What we're seeing is it's over the course of a year that students are becoming chronic at. So they may be in September where I'm really engaged with them and really on with them. And then they have, you know, housing all of a sudden that they didn't have uh, and they're back at it. Um, and I step back a little bit. So really it kind of ebbs and flows. So while we've got over 300 young people in our district that are chronically absent, caseload and case management, that number is much smaller for me. It's really the more intensive cases. Yes, I'm responding to all of those, sending the letters, all of the things, um, but it ebbs and flows throughout the year. And, and certainly I think within my position, there's, there's capacity to do the work. Okay, thank you. And thank you for doing it. Yeah. Any other questions on the first goal? All right. Let's move on to the second. Mike and I were trying to play with our screen shedding. What can you see just us or can you see the CIP? We right. can see the CIP with you along the side of sure. the screen. Going a little weird, so thank you. <laughs> um, so our, our second goal is is much similar to the first goal in that it's one target goal. However, it addresses multiple layers of our system and improvements. So our second goal, our academic goal, is that by June of 2024, we will decrease the total number of students needing tier three supports to no more than 5% of each school total student population. And what that means is that by focusing on our tier three numbers and our intervention and remediation, we'll also be looking at our tier two, so that's a reteach and, and rich components, and also tier one, which is our high quality first instruction. So in order to decrease our tier three numbers, we need to work on that entire system, including special education. Um, so we have a lot of strategies in place to be able to do that. We're pretty excited about the work that we're doing this year. Uh, we have identified universal skills in reading and mathematics so that we can target skills for students that need remediation and intervention um, to really move them quickly into getting back into the classroom, uh, which is, is amazing. Uh, we have, as Nick mentioned before, we've been working a lot on our data systems to be able to monitor student progress, um, to see how effective our interventions are, to see how effective our instruction is, and to be able to act on that quickly, to make it really accessible for our educators and students to be able to see where they are and what they need to do. Um, we're going to be working with our T's and our PLC structures, which I've kind of talked about before. Hey, um, hey Mike and Libby. The the audio for you is breaking up a little bit. Okay. I what I was <laughs> <laughs> um, let, me uh, let me turn it off the video for a second and see if that helps. Yep, yep. 
Okay. Does that seem a little better? That is a little better. Yes. Okay. What was the last thing you all heard? It really was just like a couple of sentences ago. Okay. All right. So we're going to work with our PLC um, pressures, really work with our collaborative teams in schools. As Nick mentioned in goal number one, our guiding coalitions, which are our leadership teams in each building, will really be focusing on this work, um, supporting educators and students in that. Um, we are looking at how this impacts Act 173. Our new special services coordinator, uh, Peggy Sue, um, and I and Jess Murray are working together on all of this to see how it all meshes together into supporting students across SEL, academics, and special education. Um, we're going to look at providing training for staff uh, around these skills and strategies and how to do that. Our measures are going to be around academic data. We're really going to look at how many students do we have in tier one, tier two, and tier three at any one time? How are they getting there? What are the skills that we're seeing? If we're seeing the same skill across multiple months being referred, that's going to be really telling for us. We're going to be able to act on that. We're going to be able to combine that with our SEL data to be able to look really at what do students need in both worlds um, to make them successful in school. Uh, we're getting staff trained in a number of different particular strategies. Um, and then examples are Billingham having a staff member that is able to use that strategy, that particular strategy and tool that may work for certain students um, to be able to move them along the continuum. And in that last column, we have our human material and fiscal resources. We're really going to be working with our curriculum committees, our intervention staff, our special education staff, our collaborative teams, our teachers, the instructional leadership team. We are going to be using uh, new data tools to be able to really access that easily, and then training in new systems uh, for professional development. Great. Thank you. Questions about the second goal? Emma, Emma um, and then Amanda. Um, I'm wondering what, so in the first goal, you told us what it, what the rate currently was for absenteeism. I'm wondering what the rate currently is for students needing tier three support. It's, well, I'm going to reframe it from needing to getting. Um, the students that are receiving tier three supports currently is approximately between 20% and 30%. The national average numbers say it should be 5%. That's more a reflection of our systems than it is our students. Can you explain what you mean by that a little bit more? Like the reflection of the system? And sure. The so one of the things that we're trying to move to, an example now is that, oh, first let me tell you that all of the people in our system are working really hard to help students. Um, but one of the strategies that we have right now is a lot of small group intervention. And that group may be five to seven students, let's say. And when you have five to seven students in an intervention group for three weeks, you're kind of forced to generalize a little bit the instruction that's happening there. So you're not able to take a particular student who needs these three particular skills and really move them in a group of five to seven students. So systemically, what we're trying to do is get to more targeted groups of two to three students or one individually to be able to move them on their particular needs. Um, versus having to generalize because of a, a group structure, a group size. What that means is if we do that at tier three, it means that we need to beef up our tier two instruction where students are getting reteaching in the classroom, not from an interventionist, not from a special educator. So that's a systems thing um, that's impacted by a lot of things. It's impacted by staffing, it's impacted by master schedule, it's impacted by student group size and class tradition. size. Tradition, yeah, we've done this forever. Um, so that's an example of a system thing that isn't really particular to us. It's not reflective of student need. So can you just repeat the national average is 5%? Mm -hmm. So with tier three instruction where we should be is five to 10% of kids needing, needing tier three instruction. So keeping in mind, like go back to the pillars um, that I've done a few times for the boards. And when we're talking about timely system to intervene, 
um, tier three is remediation. So we're talking about universal skills, which are generally skills that would typically be a two years behind. I mean, in the most basic sense, skills that priority standards that might be two years behind where the child is in grade level, right? So two years behind their grade level priority standards. We haven't had done a good job articulating those in the past, so we didn't have the, those skills. Our interventionists, you know, when we say tradition and what we've kind of always done, they may be team teaching on the reteach section of tier two and not necessarily targeting on kids who need remediation. And so what could happen in that instance, as we've talked about before with the board, that kids continue to fall further and further back, missing, you know, with gaping holes in their knowledge base. So by tightening those structures, we're actually doing heavy duty professional learning with our guiding coalitions next week around these structures. Um, that should help move us forward in this area. Amanda. Double audio and video. Thanks. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so my question is around um, testing. Does this include any of when we're talking about those interventions? And I know some of the families were talking about testing, testing for dyslexia and testing for all these other things. Have we, is this included in there? Um, it's connected, but it's not part of, oops, sorry. You ready? <laughs> it's connected, but it's not part of. So a piece with for, for students who has a, a special need, um, we have to show that they've gotten appropriate education, that they've gotten the appropriate teaching. Um, and so if we're doing our jobs in terms of the system with support for kids who get, who have universal needs, then like universal skill needs, then um, we have a lot more data and information about what we've tried to do for a student to support them. Uh, and right now, we're, that's a piece that's lacking. It's a lacking thing in our system. So we're working on that piece um, considerably. But this goal specifically does not does not speak to increasing uh, testing for students with special needs, with potential special needs. So is this so the remediation is not connected to special needs? It's connected to just academic achievement. Is that a student who a student who has a determined uh, special need may very well receive tier three services and tier two and tier one. So it's not an either or kind of thing. It's a both. Okay. Any other questions? Brett? Um, I have uh, questions about how the sort of assessments occur well i think that there was one point where i heard something in a meeting about there being sort of two specific windows for assessments is is this as we measure our progress towards meeting this goal are there going to be specific blocks in the school year where we have uh essentially like specific assessments that or is it or is it just going to be kind of a continuous data um, measurement, like, is that, if that makes any sense, I mean, there's, there's sort of specific tests or specific times in the year where there are specific tests or assessments, however we want to put it. Um, but there's always data collection, I guess. And are we going to, are we going to learn more? Yeah. So we're, we're, get, we're continuously looking at what students need, especially now that we have our universal skills nailed down as well as our priority standards. And we have a local assessment plan that um, does certain diagnostic and screening assessments three times a year. Three times a year. <clears throat> so will we get as the board and will we sort of discuss how things are looking three times a year or, 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 or somewhere near those windows? Yeah, if you look at the agenda planning for the year that, you know, that doc that I create yeah. every year, 
we've already put in, Mike and I have already put in dates for presentation to the board about those local assessment windows and the results of that and what's happening there. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is a little bit related to the one Amanda asked, you know, as we have done some listening sessions and then also had parents with concerns around literacy or math come and speak in during public comment. One of the things that's been sort of a theme is the desire for parents to be sort of part of the process, sort of kept in the loop, and then also maybe I know that this is not something we can expect of every parent because life at home is different, you know, no matter what home they're in. But we have heard a lot of parents saying, I really want to be able to support what you're doing at the school with my kid at home if they're receiving intervention to help them get back on track. So I'm curious to know, I see that caregivers, parents and students are part of your stakeholders in this plan. But I'm also I'm curious to know any examples you have of what you're, how you're thinking about engaging them in the, in the, in the process and not just like, Hey, how's it going? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that, but, but more like how you're engaging them in the process. Yeah, this is actually a gaping hole that we're trying to correct. Um, so when a child receives tier three services going forward, or is, in, you know, we've named it as a need for a child, the parents will be part of that team and a plan is developed. So do you want to talk more about the EST plan? Yeah, sure. So we, we met with schools to really uh, address that concern um, and to put into our system a particular stop and process a moment where we're able to communicate with families about the need. There's a range of needs. So the, the range of, of notification may look different. So for example, sometimes a student needs a little tweak, like I just need to see him for a couple of days, we're going to get this solved and they're back into it that's gonna receive a particular level of communication to the family and involvement versus something that's like a, a significant need where we see a student that we're really seriously concerned about and hey, we need y'all to come in and have a meeting with us and let's sit down and look at this together. But we also put into place where when those students are receiving those interventions, we're gonna have progress monitoring that's gonna really describe, here's the skill that we were looking at, here's where your student is right now, here's where they are at the end of this, and here's some suggestions of how you can work on this at home, depending on what it is. Um, so we built that into our systems at the school level uh, and, and made it clear that this is, here's step one, here's step two. That's, that's what's gonna happen. So we're pretty feeling pretty confident about that one. And that it's an expectation that it happens. Yep. That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. I have another one that's, um, I noted in here that you had, I'm paraphrasing here, but that you're naming this as a year of experimentation, assessment, adjustment. I really appreciate that framing of it. The like, hey, we're gonna, we're, we're really working on filling some major gaps here and we're gonna try a bunch of things out. We're gonna see what works, what doesn't and make adjustments as we go. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious to know what you're doing to, set that expectation with staff and with, with students who may think like, okay, I'm learning a new thing and I'm entering a process. And then if they don't know, oh, we're going to change up the process if it's not working, then they might feel like it's more of a jarring or like a, it, you know, their, their expectation, just expectation setting, I guess, is what I'm asking about. Yeah, there's a couple of things I can speak to with that. Um, and I want to make sure I don't forget either of them, but <laughs> there might be. So one thing is the work with the guiding coalitions. So we've beefed up our guiding coalitions, did some work with our new administrative team this year around the expectations of guiding coalitions. And just because I know that's an educational jargony buzzword there, what a guiding coalition, it, each school building has one and it's made up of the, the administration teachers. Um, and it's basically the leadership team of the school to help drive um, instructions about or um, help drive um, change efforts, right? So change efforts in both of these two areas, as well as you know the the big ones that we're always kind of working on, SEL needs and and the the like. So these teams are the ones that are going to be looking at um, what's coming in in terms of data and information and helping to make decisions about next. And their job is to go out to their colleagues. So it's not always the principal coming to them or the assistant principal, but they're the, the job of the guiding coalition. If you want to be on it, you understand 
what we're trying to do and that you know it's your job to go to your colleagues to get feedback and, and to bring that back to the team to work on. Um, so it's one way for that continuous conversation to be happening. The other thing we started um, last year, so one thing I think we really need in terms of both these goals for students and our staff are some really quick wins to gain some confidence again in what we're doing. So um, one thing we did last year with our interventionists who were left, a lot of them had to move into the classroom because of staffing challenges, but we were able to say to them, they almost needed permission to say, find two students, find one or two students who are, we've got the universal skills name, let's just really look at one or two students who need, who have a need in a universal skill and just go after it. Try some different things out. Think about the formative assessment, what's going to happen. And for the interventionists who were able to try that out, we had some monster successes right at the end of the school year. Um, and, and we as an administrative team have talked a whole lot about how do we celebrate that and how do we get that word out to people? Because one thing we know around the burnout and the overwhelming nature of school systems right now for both students and staff is that uh, they need this confidence building quick win idea that they can make a difference in the life of a kid or a kid can be successful quickly in school um, so that they want, you know, a success is an adrenaline thing. So they'll, they'll want to come back for more. So we've, we almost had to give people permission to step back and do that <laughs> last year. And we had some good success with it. So we're hoping that, um, you know, that permission has been granted again, <laughs> even though they didn't really need it, but they, they definitely needed the, um, articulated idea mm -hmm. of, of changing the system up from what it's traditionally been. Uh, and they needed, they needed Mike and I basically to say, it's okay, you know, try this out, take some risks. Um, and it, it was really helpful, I think, in that sense. So from a student's perspective, what that particular example, so we have some students that are, are receiving tier three kind of indefinitely. They're just, they always seem to end up in that. And so one of the, the, trials that we did with a student was one of those students. And by picking one skill at a time and really drilling in, that student progressed quicker than they ever had before working with an interventionist and reported to us that it just felt amazing. They, they thanked the interventionist for that Main Street Middle School. And that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. They, they didn't yeah. feel like they were just always getting the intervention and always the one going to see the interventionist they were, they, they knew what their goals were. That's another thing that research tells us is when students know where they are and where they need to go, they do better. And Definitely. so we articulated, here's the skills that we're going to work on with you. Here's how long we're going to do it. And here's how we're going to do it. And we checked them off as we went. And that student felt great about that experience. That's great. Amanda. Sorry. Um, thank you so much for that. My question around the whole of community engagement, do you feel like in this plan, you heard from like a lot of parents who are in tier three right now, uh, who have not parents, but like families and students that you got their feedback around other, other needs needed to fix the system or like to cater to the system as you're changing it? I think it's a community. Is that, a, is that a clear question? It's accumulation of the past year and a half of input, right? We've gotten tons of input from um, caregivers over the last year and a half. Uh, and the board has done a lot of that work too, right? <laughs> so it's a, it's a accumulation of all of the, the information that we've received over time. Now it's our job to think, how do we put this into a doable goal? You know, so our goals this year are super tight. They're actually, Mike is, Mike is very proud of our goals this year. So they're, they're super tight um, because they're looking at a specified defined thing like chronic absenteeism and like tier three remediation. And we know that by, if we can do these things well, again, we can build the confidence of our students and our staff. Um, and so kids want to come to school and they know they'll be successful in school and teachers know they'll be successful with kids um, and that we have a system to pick, pick everything up. 
Um, so I'm confident in the, the engagement process because of the last year and a half and the hard work that the school board has done and our, our administrative team have done in listening to, to what people have said of the real challenges that they face in our school system. Any other questions? I have a question. <clears throat> this is kind of granular, but just in terms of like implementation, um, the the our staff who's delivering tier three services are those largely exclusively interventionists, or is that also delivered by the classroom teacher? And then just thinking about this in terms of like staffing levels, do we have all of our interventionist roles? filled at this point because obviously I mean the success of this has a lot to do with the you know just people on the ground and really skilled people um, to deliver it so just how are you feeling about that are we are we well stacked up to do this Good awesome question. work excellent question. excellent question um, first I'd say the person who who is the who's responsible for doing this type of service for for kids is the person with the big largest expertise in the area Okay, and the new special education law act 173 is gives us a little bit more freedom with that, which is beautiful right um that's why I was really supportive of that law personally. Uh, the second thing i'd say is most of our staffing is in place for this, not all of it, mm -hmm. um, however, each building does have some staffing. I also can say in the last three years, all of our budget presentations have, have made, have built up the human resources needed. So it's not a matter of budgetary matter. Um, it, it definitely, it could be a staffing matter in some areas, um, but we do have people, we just have to be really smart about how we use them. Mm -hmm. But how many, we, I think we have two positions and the intervention is open. Maybe down to one. Okay. Yeah. And this is again granular, but if you're receiving tier three services, are you also on an IEP? Like, are they exclude? Like, you can be receiving tier three and not on an IEP. Yes. Yes. They are. Okay. Not so just because I saw the staffing level say that you know we have everything that we need to deliver the services of IEPs, and just trying to understand that. So. Creative thinking. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Peggy Sue could be shaking her head at me right now <laughs> in a different room. Any other questions? Um, it is the duty of the board to approve this plan. Do folks feel ready to take a vote tonight? I do. Okay. Isn't there more uh, sections? Or is that? Those are the, the two. The two? Uh, okay. I make a motion to approve the continuous improvement plan. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Congratulations and thank you very much. It is clear that even getting this plan written was a huge undertaking and it's exciting to see what y'all are gonna do with it. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Okay, and now on to policy monitoring. We have three monitoring reports, the board member conflict of interest policy, the budget policy, and the hazing, harassment, and bullying policy. Um, should we take them one at a time or? We've done it both ways, I think. In, if my memory serves when it comes to accepting and approving these. Maybe it's first reading. Oh, is that right? It's not reading, it's the reports. It's not new policies We've, or updated policies. We have um, taken a break on policy monitoring reports for about a year now. So, yeah. so we're, we're, we're so back, back at it. We're back. <laughs> yeah. Libby is back at it. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to um, propose something. Sorry. I, said, don't worry. No, go ahead. Hold one, one sec, Amanda. Go ahead, Zach. I just had a question about the conflict of interest doc. Um, 
I was just reading the language and I was wondering if it would be easier for instead of saying like he or she, if we just used like a neutral pronoun, because that's definitely possible in like legal documents and it could also save space. I noticed that too. <laughs> in that policy. What did you say, Libby? I noticed that too. Yeah. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. I'm on the policy committee and I'll make a note of that. We yeah. have to, to make a change to the policy, I believe we have to do readings and approvals. Um, A1, A2, A3, and A4 are all sort of on our docket to potentially be replaced with other policies. So as we're doing that, we will make sure mm -hmm. that the new language. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. Amanda, you ha had a proposal? Yes, I would like to propose that we look at, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, that we look at the not the bullying harassment hazing tonight um, to be able to have, have the policy monitoring report with some of other questions that we have around the data, around how it connects with the social emotional and, and just wait for that one and then we can approve the other two. So I am um, making a motion, I guess, to postpone that policy monitor report until a further agenda where we are gonna tackle the bullying harassment. Why don't you, Amanda, why don't you propose approving the other two? Okay. And then we'll, yeah, or make a motion to approve the other two. We'll take care of those and then we can talk about it. I make a motion to approve A1 and EO3 policy monitoring report. I second. Any discussion about either of those? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So Amanda, let me see if I'm, so you're imagining, I, I don't think we have anything on a future board agenda item, but I don't have the plan in front of me right now. Libby, could you, that, that um, addresses bullying or, okay. So we're talking about something that is still um, it, certainly a possibility, but nothing that's actually on the agenda um, or on a future agenda. And what I think I understand you saying, Amanda, is we would hold the monitoring report and our acceptance and approval of the monitoring report for a time when we were able to have a broader discussion about bullying and behavior and discipline and et cetera, et cetera, in school. Is that what? Yes. Okay. All right. Correct. And Emma, I am looking at the um, yearly board calendar, and we do have something scheduled for October 5th, a social emotional learning with focus on um, harassment, hazing, bullying, talk space with Lynn and Lynn. I also um, wanted to have a little more time with this policy monitoring report okay. based on a lot of like public comment that we had at a recent board meeting. Right. It felt like that comment, uh, those comments, that those testimonies showed some potential non-compliance in at least our procedures as I read through them. Um, and so I just want to take like a deeper look at that and make sure that we're not, you know, um, getting ahead of ourselves reporting compliance. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. To, uh, can I add that I think there is a, a piece around just the conversation as the board about how we look at the policy too. So it's just to combine everything in one meeting where we can look at all the different pieces where bullying and harassment intersect um, with other things and, and what it is our, you know, our, lane to be able to move and tackle the issue that we're seeing. Right. Well, yeah, what we can do within the role that we have. Emma, and then, I, okay. 
Yeah, there's some. Go for it, sorry. Um, one other just comment on the policy monitoring schedule that's laid out on our on our board calendar. Um, and Libby, this could be something for you and Jim to, to look at or talk about. But the A01, A02, A03, A04 are all being have we've been really working hard on um, sort of some replacement policies for those policies. And so those are going to become we're, what what we're envisioning is adopting a new policy that would replace uh, adopting a new set of policies that would re replace those. So I'm wondering if it's not really worth your time to monitor those over the next few meetings and maybe to I am can you tell me which which one's not with the number but with the names of yeah them? it's um so for the next meeting you have board superintendent relationship policy and then the, the board ones what's that through the board, it's all the board ones. yeah right uh, it's all the board ones so then it's um superintendent expectations and expectations for Montpelier Roxbury board members and we're basically we've been working to align our policies more closely with the VSBA policies and um so that's you know we have like five four or five policies ready to be to go in for first reading soon and those will replace these policies and so i just feel like it might be busy work for you to monitor these policies when they're about to be obsolete um i don't know if that's maybe a pietro question like maybe I, no I don't, I don't think you need to i think that i think we'll just replace the monitoring with the readings. Okay. So, and in that case, that would free up, if you remove those from your calendar, it would free up some space to potentially push this ahead and do a slightly deeper dive on some of the questions that the board has. And I, I think one of the conversations we are, thoughts that we had in the policy committee was for us to brainstorm what kind of data we wanted as a board to look at some of these policies before the policy monitor report, Libby. Um, and I don't know, like this could be a further conversation or this could be a motion now or a conversation another time, but just for us to be able to look at the policy and like, what would the board need from this policy rather than I like the compliance, but looking at the numbers, um, like for example, the bullying harassment, I would like to see how many reported cases we have and like whatever information you are able to share around that. But I can send an email with those thoughts later. Well, I would recommend if you want it in the monitoring reports, because the monitoring reports monitor the policy. Right. And add that language into the policy. So there are some policies that do require data to be presented with the with the policy monitoring report document. Um, so so that's what I would recommend to the policy team as you're looking at policy. If there's specific data you want, like for instance, how many HHB investigations were conducted throughout a year and how many were founded might be one piece of data in regards to the HHB policy that makes sense, right? To put into the monitoring document. Um, so I would put that into the policy so that it's not, you're not required, you're not relying on institutional knowledge of what the board is expecting during that time. Does that make sense, Amanda? Oh, she might be frozen. I will say based all, I can speak for Amanda, I think on this, just because we're both part yes. of it. That, that is what I'm very picturing is sort of, as we're revising these policies and putting them in for more readings to add a section that talks more specifically about what we're looking for, for policy monitoring on that specific policy. Yep. 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 So let me pause here. Is there anyone on the board who really thinks we ought to approve and accept the policy monitoring report on the hazing, harassment, and bullying. Tonight, I mean. Okay. So then that proposal is accepted by the board <laughs> to, to delay the acceptance and the approval of the of this monitoring report. Why don't we spend, we'll just take like maybe 15 minutes at the most to go to say what it is we would be 
wanting to learn from that deeper conversation around bullying, harassment, and hazing, and behavior issues, and conflict resolution, and so that that gives Libby the, you know, like starting point for what the presentation would be. Does that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, you know, it's unfortunate that we don't have the time because this is a policy that's like on the public's agenda right now. Yeah. You know, they've been coming to public comment and they're wanting some to see some action on this. It's unfortunate that we don't have the time to be more thoughtful about what types of things we like, like Libby said, to put it into the policy about and change the policy around what types of things we would want to see in a monitoring report. So, um, you know, in a way, I wonder if there's a way for us to push it out far enough to have time to look at the policy again and be more thoughtful about what we would want to see in monitoring reports. But I'm kind of like, either way, you know, it's okay because it's like, we're always improving. So it's okay for us to not have it right this time. And then for the next time, um, you know, we can learn from this experience and, and make it better from there. So either way I'm, I'm good with, but things I would want to see. <laughs> I mean, I, I agreed with Amanda. It's sort of like as much, I know that the data is sensitive on these types of things and um, there are laws around privacy and, but as much data that could be provided around the number of um, reports that were made. And then of those, how many were substantiated? Um, it would be interesting to, for me to see that that data be broken down by school, but I don't know if that's possible. I know Libby is um, you know, working with a lot of really tricky privacy stuff when it comes to this. So I wanna be respectful of that and just putting it out there as sort of a wish list and not sure if she's able to do that. Um, I, I would like, you know, just to, to honor to honor some of the testimony that we heard, I would like some of that to just be publicly addressed as to, um, you know, and I don't know if that's possible to publicly address a specific case, Yeah. but you know, there was an example that um, was discussed around a complaint had been made, it was being investigated, and then that student ended up on a bus with, um, with the person or persons that they were saying had bullied them. And, th and that is in our um, policy on- Procedures. It's on, in the procedures of the right. policy. And so it's under investigation um, 3C. And it says, for instance, if a student alleges that they have been sexually assaulted by another student, the school may decide to place the students immediately in separate classes and or transportation pending the results of the school's investigation. So it wasn't fault necessarily, but um, in this case, it was that the student ended up sitting right on the right behind that person on the bus. And that doesn't feel quite right. Um, you know, and Clearly, the person that brought the testimony didn't feel like it felt quite right. So it's those types of anecdotal stories that that make me wonder, um, you know, how do we decide compliant? You know, there's clearly people that feel like we're out of compliance. How do we decide? No, we are in compliance. Um, and it's not quite adding up to me. So I, I guess I would like those examples to be addressed since they're already part of public record, I don't know if it would be possible to do that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, so maybe we could come up with a fictitious example or something, but just to highlight, like, how do we, how do we say we're in compliance when there's people complaining that we're out of compliance? You know, how do we um, reconcile so that, those? So then we have Amanda and then Jill, and I'm gonna put myself on the list too. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I, for me, I think you will, so the, the data will be great just to know in relation to, to what kind of bullying and harassment do we have and, and how, pro, like proactive, like what proactive measures as district. I know that we are 
looking at the policy about what we do in the case of bullying and harassment, but what happens before then, what happens when it escalates. And then how how do we look at conflict in our districts? Like how are we looking at how we resolve those conflicts? I think it will be really great to see how we can improve this policy um, on, on what is happening on the ground um, in relation to what is happening on the ground. And I had another thought, but I lost it because I'm having technological issues. So I'll, I'll raise my hand again in a minute. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Jill? Um, thank you. I, I think it was, it's really helpful that we're talking through this to learn the difference between a policy, a procedure, and then a circumstance. And so this has been a really helpful conversation. I think, Emma, you kind of hit what I was wrestling with is I actually, in reviewing the policy and the procedures in the lens of what we've been hearing, I don't necessarily have a problem with the policies or the procedures that are written out, but it is that we have a discrepancy between what they say and at least what we have heard from some families. And so then what do we as a board do about that? So I, I appreciate having a little more time. I'm not sure having more data will really give us the full story, but it's more what is the path from, okay, as a board, we're seeing that we're holding, we're holding this policy and this procedure up as our district policy and procedure. And we are, we are finding, we are hearing, we are, um, observing that we are not following those, then there must be some sort of what's our next step, right? Do we address that, you know, in a, in an evaluation, do we address that in a holding a holding space in the, in the, um, a board meeting to have the discussion. So I'm not sure just having more data alone would be all that we would need. I, I do feel like what we've heard does not line up with what these, some of these procedures are. So I'm glad we're taking the time to look through that. And, and also to understand, I'm not sure that the policy itself is problematic. It's, it's the, what do you do when you're not in compliance with the policy? So was there anything more you'd want to hear during a presentation, Jill, that would? Um, yeah, and I, 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 I know we don't want to talk about specific examples. I don't want to hear specific examples that could do anything to undermine anything, but I, I would like some sort of a generalized response to the discrepancy between some of these procedures, some of these actions that were supposed to be about clear communication to families within five days um, and, you know, actions to, um, to sort of remediate the issue versus some of the examples that we did here in a public meeting. Um, and maybe I know the administrators have been working a lot this summer, so maybe there have been some generalized lessons learned or procedures that they have learned from these past couple of years that they're putting in place. But I think, I think for me, fundamentally, I would love to just hear at a future meeting um, how families are involved in a decision and how students are treated when a response or a complaint is made. I hope that's helpful. Amanda, is that the, I, I do have myself on the stack, but Amanda, is that the old, a new hand? Because you remembered the other thought? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. That's the old hand. Um, I, what I wonder is whether or not we are actually in compliance with the policy, but that the policy isn't enough to um, establish safe and safe school, you know, schools that are welcoming and safe for our students. And so I think one of the things that I would like to hear in a future presentation is, I think it builds off of what you were just saying, Jill, the it, as administrators have looked back on the, the times where they have followed the procedures that are as written, are there any gaps that they've identified that they would say to us, listen, if this is a way for the board to back us up or set up some more guidelines for us in a updated policy or a, you know, partner policy or whatever around behavior and 
discipline um, or something like that. So that's, so I guess it's more of like, an what I'd be hoping to hear is like an analysis from the administration who's been trying to enact this policy to tell us whether or not they think it's working or if we need something more. That's what I would be looking for. That would be really helpful. Uh-huh. Um, I meant to add to the, the volume of concerns that we heard that don't seem to be following these did seem to be focusing on one of our particular buildings. So I do think it might be helpful. It's probably a relation of um, the age group or something, but I, I'd love to hear specifically about how in the middle school years, um, what some of the best practices are for managing these sort of conflicts. Mm -hmm. All right, Emma. I just want to nudge um, Zach and Merrick a little bit to see if there might be anything from the student perspective that would be helpful to hear. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about data and not being sure how helpful that might be, but I mean, I'm not totally sure how many more instances of behavioral challenges we've had this year or over the, when compared with the past few years. So I think seeing some of that data in a report would be pretty useful and seeing the trends as a result. And then um, just adding on to what you were saying, Mia, when looking at that data and if it has increased or so forth, or if we've had more challenges than looking at the policy again and seeing, well, is, are there gaps in the policy that there are things that more things that we could be doing? Um, I definitely agree. I think mostly for me, it's right now seeing like the perception or at least like the policy on paper and sort of how that is being worked through and worked out and sort of comparing that to like my experience as a student. Um, and I know, I think just generally a lot of this information needs to be more accessible to students. Um, it's not exactly what we're trying to do in this, but it's sort of on my mind when I'm looking at this. I'm like, I think a lot of people could benefit from having this in a more accessible format. Yeah, just, just quickly adding on to what Zach said, I think having it accessible to students is really important to just spread awareness about what's going on. And if there have been more uh, instances of this lately, then perhaps that awareness is more important than ever. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I see we've had a number of folks join us just like in, in recent minutes. So I just wanted to say welcome, first of all, we're glad you're here. And then just to give you an update, the board had has on the agenda a, a policy monitoring report for policy F20, the hazing, harassment, and bullying policy. And the board has decided to postpone a vote to approve that or not approve it, I guess, um, until a further conversation can be had that provides more of the context for what happens in our schools um, around behavior conflict resolution, discipline, bullying, harassment, and hazing. And so right now we're just brainstorming what we would like to see in that presentation. If I could just add a little quick to Merrick's point. This is reminding me of our conversation back in June that sometimes we need a little more sort of plain English or more accessible access to this sort of stuff. Like, Hazing, harassment, and bullying each have very specific like legal definitions that things have to meet. So a family may not say, oh, my, my child had this experience or my child is having this repeated experience. I'm going to go look at the hazing, harassment, and bullying policy and see if this fits in. You know, that's not how, you know, there's, there's either things that are happening in the moment where I think a lot of students also try to problem solve these things on their own. 
Um, and then families try to problem solve them on their own. And the chances of them sort of navigating their way to finding this and then interpreting the legal language to help them understand what their rights and responsibilities are. Um, I know it's hard to sort of boil things down to make them more accessible, but I definitely think like at the very least, our students who are, um, you know, maybe middle and high school should sort of know what are my rights? What are my, what are, what are my steps I should take if I feel like I'm experiencing X, Y, Z. And I'm not sure that that's really clear until something is escalated. So maybe it's as simple as having plain language things that are a little easier to find or um, proactively shared with families at the beginning of the school year or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on what would be helpful in a presentation and discussion around this? Me, I think Amanda has her hand raised again. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, Amanda. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. I, I think, so I, and I don't know how to do this, but I want to make, I hate statements, but something, a letter to the community as a board to say, you know, we got to kind of, to basically before school starts, I feel like we need to do something to start the conversation um, as a board, as a community about what is happening in our schools. And just to say, you know, like, we got to talk to our kids at home and this is what's happening. And, you know, we'll be working through this in the next couple of months as they come, but we really need to make an effort as a whole community to tackle these issues. And here's some points around bullying harassment. Here's the policy. And, you know, that's something that, like, you know, like I feel like we, we should start that. Um, and, as we walk, work through the rest, um, I feel like we shouldn't start the school year doing nothing. So I don't know. I guess it's a proposal that we do something um, that is that we can send out through different channels. Maybe, you know, we can write a letter to the editor or not or, you know, something. But we need to do that. That's what I wanted to say before. I don't know. <clears throat> so I guess it's a proposal. I don't know what uh, have we seen an agenda yet for the retreat and how built out that is a, at this point, but that feels like it could be a good topic for conversation when we really have like the space and time to kind of dig into um, an approach that feels right, that makes sense, that's you know responsive. Um, and is also like prudent, you know, it's like, let's work with the information that we have without assumption, without bias, but um, is absolutely recognizing what we've heard from the community, certainly more than once. Um, so I would suggest that if there's room within the retreat schedule that we build that conversation there of what's an appropriate um, and meaningful uh, board response at this point in time. It does seem to naturally build on what we worked on for our first retreat yeah. and, and sort of prioritizing safe schools. And if kids aren't feeling safe, you know, maybe this becomes a priority for us mm -hmm. as a board. Libby, do you have the agenda for the um, retreat written up yet or drafted? No, Jim and I have not spoken about that. Okay. All right. Let's include it as an idea then, Rhett. Um, when we go through with the monitoring, um, this policy, I'm wondering if, um, I know that there are a lot of cases in which there's sort of, there's sort of kids that are having a hard time, let's say, and maybe discipline is the, the, the sort of the best approach in this situation and other times when sort of, a whole lot of support is the best approach and not ex and maybe not exactly discipline. And I'm not sure. I know that those two, there are sort of situations where those can overlap. 
Um, and I'm wondering if it's possible for there to be sort of a hypothetical situation that describes how the administration sort of swings between those two approaches um, to dealing with challenging behaviors, um, because it might be helpful for, it would be helpful for me to know how that, I know it's a, it's a balancing act, and it would be helpful for me to hear how that might look. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that that would be helpful for community members to hear how that might look because it's a very delicate um, thing to sort of swing between someone needing a, a whole lot of support because they're really struggling and then there being this sort of discipline of, um, that's necessary. And I know that <clears throat> if I'm, um, you know, the parent of a, of a child who has, has been treated, you know, unkindly, um, I sort of want to know that there's been discipline and I, and I might benefit from understanding how additional support and discipline can kind of, um, overlap or sort of where some circumstances where one is more appropriate than the other, I guess. Mm -hmm. How they relate to each other. Yes. Is that, are you back to the presentation itself? And yes. The suggestion or thought of like a the... sort of hypothetical situation yep. okay. where to help, just to help make that explicit, how yep. the, those two, how that, that happens. So that's another request for the presentation. And then on to the, what the board can do at the, to, at the start of the school year um, to sort of respond to and maybe set the tone around this. Amanda, are you, does that, does um, Kristen's idea of using time at the retreat to talk about this? Oh, I see, thumbs up. Okay, great. <laughs> that's funny. I'm still looking at your phone icon over there, but I see you now. Um, okay, so then. I just want to note that I, I, you know, I really appreciate the the community input that we've heard on this topic. And, you know, we it's one thing to be on the board. It's another thing to be an administrator. And it's another thing to be you know, a family member or a student that is experiencing this policy through a lived experience at a school. So I, I really value those perspectives. And I want to make sure that we, you know, use um use this as an opportunity to engage these families that have come forward and, and want to work with us as a board and the administrators um, to improve our, our schools. And I think we have a really great opportunity with a new principal to set the tone. And I'm sure Libby and that principal have a lot of plans in place, um, you know, to, to change the culture and, and to set a tone um, culturally at the middle school specifically. Um, so I wonder if there's just any way for us to partner with this, these community members who have already um, come forward to, to help inform us how their lived experience has been with this policy. And I would like to somehow, um, you know, capture this as an opportunity to, to partner with them. So maybe that's discussed at the retreat as well. Or maybe Libby already has plans, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, with that, our next agenda item is actually to go into executive session for the discussion of personnel, um, specifically in this case, the annual evaluation of the superintendent. Um, can I have a motion to move into an executive into executive session to discuss personnel? So moved. Great. <laughs> is there a second? second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, everyone who popped in to join us for the meeting. Um, we're going to say goodbye.